Hello, everyone, and welcome to our monthly event. Great to know that there are so many of you joining us today to talk about quantum. I know that there are people joining from all over the world, again, from the US. I know people are watching from Moscow, and some people are even joining from Andalusia in Spain. So welcome. I am Katia Moskvich, the editorial lead here at IBM Research, and I am here today at, at IBM Research in Zurich. Excellent. Our topic today couldn't be more exciting, actually. It's all about using quantum computers, as you saw in the title of the webinar, using quantum computers for uh, unlocking secrets of the universe uh, with particle accelerators, such as the one at CERN near Geneva. And um, this, is, this is incredibly exciting. It's all about high energy physics, uh, particles accelerating and colliding, producing other particles in the process, and some hopefully new ones uh, that can you know, shed some light on some fundamental questions that we don't yet have an answer to. And this is exactly what the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is busy doing at CERN. I'm sure you all remember the LHC, of course, uh, especially after it discovered uh, the Higgs boson a few years ago. So that was pretty amazing. Um, and uh, very recently, CERN, uh, the European, which actually stands for European Organization of Nuclear Research, joined the IBM Quantum Network as a hub. So what do I mean by that? Uh, it means that scientists now working at CERN, which is, of course, you know, it's a lot of scientists from a lot of universities all over the world, now have access to IBM's fleet of quantum computers, which is super, super cool. Uh, they can access them through the cloud. And at the same time, CERN can provide quantum computing services to, you know, partners all over the world as well, which is really amazing. Uh, so, um, our experts here today uh, will, I'm sure, you know, give you a lot more details, tell you about whatever it is they're going to be doing uh, much better than I am telling you right now. But before I actually introduce you to them, let me remind you all joining us here today to please send us your questions in the chat, okay? And we'll try to uh, get to them uh, on air or through the chat because we've got uh, uh, actually a stellar team of scientists here behind the scenes. Uh, you can see them here. They are all here today to answer your questions in real time. And we'll try to get uh, to as many questions as we possibly can. So please do, um, please do ask away. So um, now the experts. Joining me here today are Ivano Tarvanelli, Global Leader for Advanced Quantum Simulations at IBM Research Europe, and Alberto Di Meglio, Coordinator of the CERN Quantum Technology Initiative and Head of CERN Open Lab. Now, we're not showing them to you just yet. Why? There's a reason. Because we'd like to show you a really cool video of CERN. Here we go. Welcome to CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. In the Large Hadron Collider, we smash particles together to investigate the universe, how it works, what it is made of. This type of research it results in a huge IT and computing challenges. Quantum computing might not provide all the answers, but it may help us see the universe more clearly and ask better questions. All right, so... Joining me here today is the guy you just saw in the video, Alberto. Hello. Hi, Katia. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. So, um, could you please give us maybe some basics to begin with? Uh, what exactly is the research at CERN and what are you guys actually doing? What are the challenges uh, that CERN will face with, you know, new generation of experiments and particle accelerators? Just give us a brief overview. Yes, 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 uh, gladly. So, I mean, as you know, CERN is a European, but uh, actually international research facility. It was founded uh, uh, quite a few years ago in 1954 uh, as a place where collaborative science, fundamental science, could be done by researchers from all, all over the world. 
the, 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 the specific goal of CERN is to actually build and operate so the, the particle accelerators. And today, the, the, the big accelerator, the main one, is the Large Hadron Collider. But this is a facility that is offered to experiments from many, many uh, countries in the world to, to come and do research together. So until now, this has been uh, extremely uh, successful. We uh, we have uh, made uh, fundamental discoveries. You mentioned the Higgs boson. This is uh, you know one of the most uh, famous. But uh, there are there, there have been almost 60 um, uh, different discoveries of new particles and, and new configurations of uh, of uh, matter in the past uh, several years. And today we use uh, a, a collaboration across the, the world of computing and, and data uh, resources uh, that is reaching the, the exabyte level, is, uh, you know, is reaching really astonishing levels. And the, the, the new experiments, the new uh, generation of the accelerators are going to go beyond that. So we estimate that in the coming years, we might need 10 to 100 times the resources we are using today. And that doesn't work, we cannot scale. So we need to rely a lot on technologies to, to you know, to introduce new ways of working and, you know, quantum technology is one of the things we are looking at. So I, I guess behind you, right? So this is the data center uh, yes, that you're yes. referring to. So at the moment, this is what is actually dealing with all that data coming out of the collider, right? Yeah, I mean, one, yes, is one of the steps. Yes, not yet quantum. This is the production facilities, the data center we have here, which is, uh, we call it the tier zero, is where the, the data comes into from the experiments before being distributed across the world. Yeah. And I'm sure you can appreciate my t-shirt today, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I hope our viewers can also recognize, you know, this is uh, quite an amazing image. I actually, when I bought the t-shirt, I thought maybe I should also get like um, an actual picture and like hang it in my living room because that would be, that would be amazing. Maybe uh, I'm sure some physicists at CERN probably have that actually. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. So speaking of quantum, um, before we go to Ivano here, actually, I have another question for you uh, quickly, Alberto. Like, wh yep. why why is quantum so exciting? I mean, yes, you you mentioned you know uh, using it for for the data, but is there anything else that it can, it can do for CERN in the future? So there, yeah, I mean, there are many many ways, many places where uh, you know the the the. the uh, the effects given by using uh, quantum computers may play a fundamental role. So a, a lot of the problems we have to solve, a lot of the, of the different classes of computation and data processing uh, actually uh, are exponential or have a combinatorial scaling uh, effect. This is in, in many, you know, many different areas, for example, data tra track reconstructions or uh, quantum field simulations and radiation simulator simulations, lattice gauge theories. Uh, all, all these, uh, th these problems uh, uh, it would not scale well uh, with increasing precision and accuracy by by doing this uh, in the coming years only on, on classic classic resources. And one one uh, uh, interesting class of uh, of problems that we may talk a, a little bit more about it is data classification. How do you extract uh, rare events? Uh, the difficult ones from uh, the, the the background of everything that happens when protons collide in the in the accelerator, and there are indications that by using some uh, quantum uh, techniques, uh, actually in the future we might go beyond what is classically possible today. This would be very very interesting, amazing for for the community. But essentially, it's the start of the journey. Uh, this we are we are exploring possibilities, and we we have good insights. The vision, if you want, I, uh, this is uh, maybe a, quite a few years uh, in, in the future, but imagine being able to actually take uh, the, the, the quantum state of data coming out of the detectors and feed them, feed this data, quantum data, into a, a quantum computer directly and get out the answer of the universe. That, I mean, I'm really looking forward for that to happen. Yeah, answers of the universe. I mean, this just sounds mind blowing to me anyway. <laughs> Super cool. Okay, well, um, I'd love to go to our second expert now, to Ivano Tarvinelli, my uh, colleague actually here at IBM Research. Hi, Ivano. Hello, Katya. How? Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, cool. So, um, question for you. Knowing that you're obviously a physicist and a quantum computing expert, could you tell us more about the role of quantum computing for high energy physics kind of more generally. I know Alberto just kind of went into some detail here in, in, in his answer, of course, but 
for you specifically, where do you see the relevance of quantum computing as you know related to high energy physics? Uh, yes, of course. So. Um... In addition to the applications uh, that uh, Alberto just mentioned, we can use uh, quantum algorithms uh, to detect events uh, compatible with new physics. So that is uh, everything that is beyond uh, what can be understood uh, and interpreted today. So in fact, what we can do is to train uh, quantum machine learning algorithms to detect anomalies in the data and analyze them to discover new phenomena that go beyond the standard model of particle physics. That would be really very cool. So another application uh, of interest uh, could be uh, jet reconstruction. So let me explain uh, this concept in more details. So when two particles collide, uh, for instance, uh, two proton uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, they break into their constituents, uh, meaning uh, the, the quarks uh, and the gluons, uh, and eventually they also generate uh, new particles. However, uh, we cannot unfortunately directly observe uh, the products of these collisions. In fact, the detectors are placed meter away from the point of the collision. And uh, what we observe in reality are reconstructed jets of particles uh, that travel from the point of the collision to the surface of the detector. So with the jet reconstruction process, we recompute the particle trajectories that reach the detector in order to understand the physics back at the point of, uh, of the collision. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the number of possible paths that uh, define uh, the jets uh, is growing exponentially with um, with the number of particles that reach the detector. And therefore, it's hard to solve this uh, problem uh, classically. And we hope that uh, with the use of uh, quantum computer, we can speed up and improve uh, this process. Finally, another application that uh, we are exploring uh, is the solution of the quantum field theory equations. So that is uh, uh, the standard model at uh, the low energy regime. This is a very interesting regime because it's the regime where a perturbation theory is not working, so we cannot solve it mathematically. And classical computers are limited by the exponential scaling of the complexity of the problem. And therefore, it's hard to solve uh, these equations with a classical computer. So we certainly are exploring scalable quantum algorithms for lattice uh, gauge theory to model this kind of uh, theories, so quantum electrodynamics, for instance, quantum chromodynamics, so the, the interaction between uh, uh, gluons uh, and quarks, which are the fundamental theories of uh, the subatomic scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that sounds uh, sounds really, really amazing. And uh, just to remind our viewers here behind you, of course, and well, you've got a, a proper actually physical model behind you of a quantum computer, right? Uh, so something that uh, we have here in the lab and something that people can actually access through the cloud. So this is what it looks like. It doesn't look like a regular computer at all. It looks like a really cool, you know, dystopian chandelier or something. I've got the same thing here on a poster. So, you know, a little bit uh, less exciting than what you have, Ivana. So I'm a bit jealous, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> what can we do, right? Um, Anyway, actually, uh, excitingly for you, we've got our first questions coming in from the audience. And somebody here is, I don't have names, uh, but somebody here is asking, will quantum computers be able to simulate the processes we examine in a collider in reasonable computational time? What do you think, Ivana? Yeah, but one of uh, the applications would be in, indeed uh, to put uh, a quantum computer in between so the experiment and the collection of data. So as Alberto was explaining before, uh, we can use it uh, to filter uh, what uh, comes from the detector and uh, using a support vector machine only take uh, the events uh, that uh, contains interest in physics and discard all the rest uh, so that uh, we can handle the amount of data that uh, Alberto was uh, uh, discussing before. So that would be definitely uh, an application. It's hard because there would be many data involved. So it's uh, definitely probably not for near term, but uh, is one of uh, 
the applications uh, we are looking for. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's super cool. And uh, of course, now you know, as 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 we said before, CERN is a hub in the IBM Quantum Network, which which is quite quite amazing. Uh, but you know, I'm sure that many viewers here probably are wondering, you know, what that actually means. So, could you maybe explain to us what these quantum hubs are in in general, and you know, where where else they are, and why why do we need them? So, what they do? Just a little bit of. Uh, background on quantum hubs yes of course so the mission of the hub is to partner with academia so the university but also research institutes and industry to explore promises promising use cases so this is really the key point right so we are looking for use cases where we can apply our technology and this is in different domains that goes from natural science obviously including high energy physics but also other fields like uh, optimization, finance, uh, and uh, machine learning in general. Mm -hmm. As a hub, CERN has its own dedicating access, and this is really uh, the, 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 probably the most important aspect of being a hub. It has access to the IBM quantum fleet of more than 20 quantum computers. In addition, the IBM support to the hubs includes uh, onboard training, and technical assistance in terms of uh, research. This is why we have this collaboration also with CERN. Education, mm -hmm. also very important, you mentioned it several times, and the development of new applications. We have uh, other IBM Quantum apps that include universities uh, in many different countries. In addition to the US, uh, we also have apps uh, in, uh, for instance, Japan, Australia, Canada, UK, Germany, Portugal, and most probably many other places. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So in uh, um, yeah, in the future, I think uh, uh, the hubs uh, will likely be sharing tools, experiences, and best practices uh, to boost uh, the rapidly the emerging field of quantum computing. This is the goal. So we have many hubs, and these hubs need to talk together and help uh, developing uh, the field. Uh, Let's conclude saying that uh, uh, in addition to the hub, IBM has other models of collaboration. So for instance, we have a dense uh, network of academic collaborations with many other universities uh, across the globe. And also here is where uh, we do uh, most of our development. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, collaborations are super important, right? Like if we were just working by ourselves, like it doesn't matter if you're a university or if you're, a, you know, a company, if you're just doing your stuff by yourself, then you're not going to go very far. So, you know, I think uh, collaborations, be they like private, public collaborations, even like what's happening now, right? Uh, IBM and uh, lots of universities that are working with CERN, science knows no borders. I don't know. In, in my view, like, if you're a scientist, you're clever, then it doesn't matter where you work if you're working on the same goal, right? So um, anyhow, speaking of the hub, uh, we've got a question here for Alberto from somebody in the audience. So here we go. Alberto, how do you envision the progress of quantum computing at CERN? What will be the next steps after becoming a quantum hub? That's a good one. <laughs> yes, we, are, we have just started already looking at the next steps. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it, it's, a, it's an important question. So, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you mentioned already a few times, I mean, the, the key word here is collaboration. CERN is a place for collaboration. And uh, I mean, this is true in general for, uh, for fundamental research. Quantum technologies, quantum computing, introducing, introducing, introduces, sorry, even, uh, e even more the need for collaboration. It's a, a truly a multidisciplinary kind of, of field. You need computer scientists, you need the experts of the domain, you, you need engineers. So uh, what we are doing at CERN, and this, this is what happened uh, last year, we have started a dedicated uh, quantum technology initiative, which I'm, I'm the coordinator of, um, e exactly with the goal of understanding what, uh, what is happening today at CERN, how to coordinate uh, all the possible different activities in this field, uh, to measure the impact of, uh, of uh, quantum computing and quantum technologies for fundamental research, not only in computing, for example, also sensing and theory and networks and communications are, are, are in scope, but especially how to work better with uh, 
the rest of the community. So CERN is by far not the, the you know, the first place where quantum technology uh, is, uh, is looked at and, and uh, not the biggest. There are many other activities. You mentioned universities. You already have a lot of universities and companies in your, uh, in your, uh, in your network. So the next steps are to build this community within, uh, you know, as part of the high energy physics community, uh, understand the requirements, understand what scientists want, want to do, understand what are the most interesting projects to run together. And we have uh, already quite a few uh, running at the moment, but also provide ways of actually improving and supporting the the building new knowledge these are this is these are definitely emerging fields and we are targeting not necessarily but by by definition the research being done today but the research that, that we have to do in the coming three, five, 10, 20 years, looking at high luminosity LHC, the next generation of LHC, and even further, the, 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 the next, uh, the future circular collider. We need to help uh, you know, young researchers, engineers, scientists, physicists, to be able to understand what quantum computing is, what it means, what uh, knowledge and skills you need to, to acquire, and that will apply those skills in the, in the field in, in the in the best way so these are the next steps is a, a lot of research a lot of collaboration and especially building this community together yeah absolutely and uh you know you mentioned uh, the future generations of uh, particle colliders i remember i visited cern a couple times and the last time when i visited i think it was two years ago everybody was super excited talking about like how you guys going to upgrade it, what you're going to do. And all the scientists are already kind of looking into the future and uh, how these machines can indeed uh, keep just keep getting better. And uh, quantum, it's just, uh, I think, really cool technology that could, you know, help sure. during this process. Yep. So that's yep. Yep. Super cool. Um, we've got an interesting question, actually, uh, for you, Alberto, again here uh, from an intern at CERN. Hmm. I wonder who that is. So uh, the question is, <laughs> I am an intern at CERN working on anomaly detection at CMS. Will quantum machine learning replace regular deep learning in the near future for such tasks? Interesting. This is actually throwing us a little bit ahead of the, in our discussion because we haven't really talked about the paper you guys are working on. We'll, we'll get to it uh, more in detail later, but maybe you can just address uh, the quantum machine learning yeah. a little bit now and we'll sure. get back to it more, more in detail. Yeah, uh, I think the key word here is, uh, is uh, in the near future. <laughs> so uh, th this is, a, of course, is a very interesting question. We need to understand exactly what is the role of technology. So what we are investigating, and we can talk with Ivan a bit more of, uh, of, of some specific cases, what, what we are looking for at the moment is exactly where it makes sense to use quantum technology, quantum computing devices, and also simulations and getting, getting there. There are areas that we can see today are promising places for, uh, for actually introducing significant uh, changes. This is not near term for, for, uh, for many reasons. Uh, you know, the technology is evolving, the problems have to be understood, but it is necessary to start doing this uh, today. Okay, I, I, uh, I actually heard, I think th this morning from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from another person, uh, an interesting analogy, you know, saying that when uh, at the beginning of the century, at the last century, when uh, when people was uh, were, were using trains, so there was, you know, some brave uh, en engineer building uh, almost uh, paper airplanes, and nobody at the time thought uh, this could become a viable means of transport. But there were people already looking at, uh, you know, how to build a business. On that, I, I liked this analogy very much. It took some time. But in, uh, when uh, all, all the different pieces be, you know, got together, the technology, the infrastructure, the knowledge, uh, you know, aerospace, aeronautical engineers and material specialists, et cetera, uh, the airplanes became one, you know, today, you know, the COVID uh, permitting, you know, this is a different situation, but in principle, it's, uh, it, it's the, the, the way of traveling long distance today. There is no, no better. So we, we are in the same journey. Uh, it is not near term, but uh, it is a place where we want to be. Mm, yeah, absolutely. No, it's a, it's a great analogy, actually. I love it. Um, and this intern, please come and see me. I mean, I, I think we're just <laughs> a few cool. minutes. We can talk uh, directly over a coffee. That's a really great suggestion. Um, I'm sure the intern right now is thrilled. Thank you, Alberta. 
Um, so, uh, Ivano, actually, uh, I've got a question for you. And if we can go back to this, uh, you know, whole Quantum Hub uh, announcement, which is super exciting, of course. So, if I understand correctly, um, you know, if an organization is, is, is using IBM's quantum computers as a hub, it's kind of slightly different to just using a quantum computer like from time to time over the cloud, right? Like, so what's what's the actual difference between kind of being a hub or not being a hub and just connected connecting to IBM uh, quantum computers through the cloud? Yes, uh, indeed, there is uh, some differences uh, being a hub uh, or uh, just uh, a user uh, of uh, the IBM facilities. So in addition to the privilege access uh, to the IBM quantum computers that uh, I mentioned before, so as a hub, CERN, in this case, uh, can invite uh, external partners to join its net network. And uh, this you can do by signing, for instance, new contracts with universities or other research uh, centers. In this process, they don't have uh, to involve IBM. This is a very important point. Uh, this means that CERN can handle uh, the relations uh, with, uh, with the partners in the way it is uh, more convenient for them. Mm, right, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Cool, um, and um, Alberta, uh, uh, what, what's your kind of view? Like, what, what do you think will change with CERN now becoming a, a quantum hub? I mean, we kind of touched upon this a little bit, but uh, if you could just, I guess, summarize it a bit more. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So, I mean, we have been working with uh, with IBM. I mean, CERN has been part of the of, of the IBM Q network for, uh, for some time, I think 2018, uh, 2019, uh, as an individual member. Uh, now, I, I mean, we, we, I, I keep mentioning collaboration. This is the important aspect. So being a hub means that uh, we can partner with, uh, with the institutes working in, in the community and with experts in physics and computer science and set up joint projects that together can benefit from accessing the, the 20 plus fleet of, uh, of computers that uh, Ivano mentioned, IBM uh, expertise, and we work very, very well with Ivano and, uh, and the Zurich uh, Research Center. So th this possibility is, uh, is part of, you know, for, for us, uh, it, it is what it means being a hub. It means that other people with the, within the community as part of the experiment, as part of projects, can enjoy the same access and, and the same uh, uh, possibilities that uh, that we have today and produce you know better results this is really multidisciplinary so this is the way we work so it fits very well in the in the certain spirit to working in this way yeah no for sure and uh, well, what about um, kind of the expertise of, of researchers and specifically in high energy physics do you, do you think they all need to be like you know experts in quantum <laughs> already now or what's the deal here <laughs> so it, it depends I mean I, I think uh, so certainly, I mean, it's not uh, enough uh, to be an expert in quantum mechanics uh, to be, you know, to know everything about quantum, about quantum computing. Probably helps, uh, but uh, you know, these are different, uh, different profiles, uh, different, uh, different professions. So uh, yes, I mean, I, I touched upon this. We we really need to understand uh, how we introduce this knowledge in the in the community, and to actually it's it's actually a matter of bridging different communities sometimes. So the, the you know it's not about uh, energy physics only, but very often uh, the specialists work in their field and try to solve problems in their field. Now, with the possibility, you know, quantum computing is a is a very interesting paradigm of how doing that would not work. It's really necessary to bridge uh, these different communities and work together in, uh, in, in joint projects. Uh, this is what we call, many people call, in a way, co-development. You know, it's, it's necessary to, 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 to have different skills uh, together to advance the state of the art across the board. And, and, and we need to, to provide the means of doing that. Is training, is uh, uh, in academic uh, type of, uh, of, uh, of lectures and, uh, and opportunities, also working with universities to maybe change some of the uh, of their uh, parts of their CV, of their uh, um, academic curriculum to, to enable this kind of, uh, of, of changes. So it, it's, it's fascinating. It's the start of, a, again, of a journey. Very yeah. exciting to be there. For sure, for sure. I mean, uh, I remember, you know, I I never had quantum physics at uh, high school, obviously, and not at all. And I only studied quantum physics when I did my postgrad degree much, much later. But uh, when my son was born, I actually bought him a 
a tiny book, Quantum Physics for Babies. So, <laughs> so that was a good start. So it was very Absolutely. Good. Yeah, start early. <laughs> start early. Good I point. Think exactly. So who knows? Maybe a few years from now, there will be quantum physics, uh, even on the high school level. That would be, that would be terrific. And um, Ivano, uh, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this, actually? Yeah, I mean, I also believe that uh, it's very, very important that uh, we form a strong community and uh, we start uh, training people uh, from from the, from high school uh, to learn how to program a quantum computer and how to solve uh, uh, the, the problems of our society with uh, this uh, new type uh, of technology. So uh, this is why IBM has developed already some time ago a software platform uh, called the Quantum Lab that allows everybody, even uh, at school, so to, to test uh, algorithms and also execute them on, on a quantum computer. So you can do really real experiments uh, nowadays on a quantum computer. For instance, uh, you can test the fundamentals of quantum mechanics uh, by proving Bell's uh, inequalities. So using uh, the Quantum Lab, uh, that is put on the cloud by IBM. So in addition, we have Qiskit, that is the software platform of IBM, also open source available on GitHub, which has a very powerful and unique library of modules for the solution of many problems. Already mentioned before, modules for the solution of problems in natural science, for instance, in maths, uh, physics, uh, biology, medicine, material science, uh, but also problems in optimization, machine learning, uh, and finance. So that's also a very promising field uh, where we can apply uh, a quantum computer. Uh, obviously, in order to do that, in indeed, as we were mentioning before, we need uh, a dense uh, training program. And this is uh, why IBM is uh, organizing uh, many events uh, you know that uh, we are organizing schools, uh, tutorials, uh, hackathons, uh, where uh, the young people uh, can join and learn uh, this new technology. And obviously CERN as a hub uh, will certainly partner in these uh, activities, in these educational activities, uh, especially uh, when, when it's about uh, applications in theoretical physics and particle physics, but not only, obviously. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's really cool. I mean, you you mentioned hackathons, and uh, you know there are also Kiskit camps. Uh, this is, I think, is is really cool. It's kind of introducing young people to to quantum in a really fun way. So, um, you know, this is uh, this is quite amazing. And there are quantum gaming as well. So there's lots lots going on. Um, okay, uh, back to our chat here. So somebody's actually asking you, Ivano. What is the prospect of quantum computing in quantum chemistry? How one can start thinking about a use case right now? OK, so um, thanks for the questions. Uh, quantum chemistry indeed was one of uh, the first uh, applications of quantum computing envisaged already a long time ago. Even Richard Feynman was uh, at this idea to use quantum technology for this purpose. Um, yes, I mean, we have already a lot of work done in this direction. We have very promising algorithms uh, can, that can solve uh, electronic structure problems. Uh, I would say that um, the problem that we are facing at the moment uh, is the fact that, that the accuracy that is needed uh, in uh, quantum chemistry calculations, the so-called chemical accuracy, is a very tiny number that is hard to get uh, with a quantum computer. But we are definitely working also in this direction. And hopefully, uh, when we will have uh, slightly larger uh, quantum computers, uh, we will be able also to show advantages in this domain. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I am I have no doubt about that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, actually, you know what I've been thinking? Well, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, CERN, of course, discovered the Higgs boson, right? So what if we had a quantum computer when we were searching for the Higgs? Do you think we would have found it earlier? What do you guys think? What do you, Alberto, think? <laughs> yes, maybe. Uh, so uh, let's let's put it this way. I want to be non-committal. Let's put it this way, <laughs> seriously. The, 
uh, you know, the, the, uh, okay, well, what you see here is something that we show in the in, in the visitor center. Uh, we we monitor technology and uh, we have made a sort of simulation. How long would it take today to to process LHC data if we had the technologies still from the 60s or the 70s? And, you know, for example, with mainframes available in the 60s to pro process uh, the, the data out of, of the accelerator, accelerator today, it would take almost the entire age of the universe. And this is technology that was available 50 years ago, again, not, not so, so long ago. And, and, you know, even with technology from 1985, it would have, you know, the dinosaurs should have started the, the, the computation to have results today. So we see these leaps. You no, know, there are step like a step increase in in, in the way uh, in the technology helps uh, this kind of uh, of research. So this is the effect that uh, we 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 hope for, we expect from changing paradigms. You know, we went from uh, you know mainframes to commodity computing, from um, single cores to many cores, 32 bits to 64 bit, from Von, von Neumann to non von Neumann applications. Quantum computing is the next is the next frontier. So we expect the same type of uh, of effect. It, it is actually uh, the 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 only way to to make uh, the, the kind of research we do actually progress uh, towards the next uh, challenges you know, dark matter and everything that we still need uh, to discover. So my answer is. Uh, Yes, <laughs> there is, a, you know, you can see a lot of hope behind my yes, but uh, I mean, I'm, I think this is what happens. At the end. Well, you know what, you mentioned dark matter. Oh my God, you know, this is exactly what I did my, my MPhil thesis on, on dark matter and FRBs. Uh, and uh, yeah, I wish I had a quantum computer when I was studying at King's College, but hey, <laughs> maybe I should do another degree in a few years time. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, a question for you, Alberto, now that I have you here uh, next to me on the screen. Somebody is asking, I want to know about research opportunities in high energy physics with quantum computing. Speaking of education and stuff, my master's thesis is in particle physics, and I have been active in quantum computing for more than a year now. So, yeah, so, okay. It, it, I mean, it depends also where. So let, let's let, let me start locally. So CERN has this new CERN quantum technology initiative. There is a, a website, which is simply quantum.cern. You, you, you can go there and uh, we, we publish, uh, it's, you know, again, it's, uh, we, we are starting that. So the, the, the website is being uh, uh, populated now with, uh, with information and, and opportunities, but we will put there everything we are doing and all the opportunities uh, we, we have. We have started already a number of projects, so there are more projects in the pipeline that we will, uh, we will start. So going there is a good starting point. But then, you know, this is a, you know, quantum computing and quantum technology is a field that, uh, you know, many universities and many initiatives are working on. You know, Europe, if you, if you want, uh, has, a, you know, a flagship project, the, you know, the, the quantum uh, flagship uh, initiative and US have similar, uh, similar uh, uh, initiatives and programs. Uh, the, 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 the European Commission is, uh, is launching a number of very interesting projects in the coming years uh, to explore everything in the stack, uh, hardware, algorithm, software, the end-to-end -end stack of quantum computing. So there will be many opportunities. Um, so as far as we are concerned, go to the website and we will keep you informed. I guess that universities and institutes will do, will do the same. So lots of opportunities. Yeah, sounds super cool. Well, um, and now I'd love to talk actually to both of you about some recent rather mind-blowing in, in my, um, for, for me anyway, uh, research that you two, I think, have been doing together on quantum machine learning. We briefly mentioned it earlier in, uh, because somebody asked a question about that. Um, now, if, if we actually take a step back, right, because quantum machine learning, that sounds quite cool, but also probably a little bit unfamiliar to many people. So maybe we should start just with, you know, really briefly, regular machine learning. So Ivana, maybe you could give us first uh, like a brief over overview of what machine learning is and how quantum machine learning is different and how it can actually help. Yeah, um, okay, okay. The, the, this is uh, really a very interesting question. But uh, let me start maybe from, from the origin, right? So we need to talk about uh, the scientific method. Uh, this was developed uh, roughly in the 1600s with people like uh, Galileo and Newton. 
and many others. Um, and essentially, it is based on the mathematical modelization of nature. And this was really a success. So if we are here talking about science, uh, is because of the great work of, uh, of these people. Of course. But uh, uh, with uh, the advent of the computers in the last century, and more recently with uh, the big uh, data science, we have now the possibility to train a computer and therefore a machine right, to, uh, to recognize patterns uh, in the data and automatically infer a solution for uh, new problems. And uh, all this without a precise deterministic model of uh, what we are investigating. And this is, I really find amazing. Uh, now coming uh, to, to quantum machine learning algorithms, uh, in most cases, uh, these are based on concepts uh, that are derived from classical machine learning. Not always, but uh, in many cases. So we have, uh, for instance, uh, quantum uh, neural networks. We have uh, quantum Boltzmann machines. Uh, we have uh, quantum classifiers, uh, as we used uh, in, uh, in our uh, demonstration with CERN. So the, coming to the differences, the main difference uh, compared to classical machine learning uh, is that uh, we can make use of uh, the exponentially large uh, Hilbert space of the qubits, uh, which can enable, for instance, a more efficient and accurate classification of the data. And in, in, a, in a more specific case for high energy physics, uh, we believe that a quantum computer can also better capture the, the quantum correlation effects and entanglement uh, that is in the data that may be hard to, uh, to get classically. Mm -hmm. And this is because we are modeling quantum with quantum, exactly like uh, Richard Feynman was proposing uh, about 40 years ago. So namely modeling uh, quantum mechanics uh, with uh, quantum technologies. Obviously, all this is still under investigation and uh, we are really far from the end of our journey. But uh, to succeed in this process, uh, I believe it is uh, very important to work uh, in these collaborations. Uh, and in the case of high energy physics, uh, with an institute uh, such as uh, CERN. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's super cool. And uh, you mentioned uh, Richard Feynman. Uh, I mean, I actually have a few books written uh, by Richard Feynman. And uh, people listening right now, especially students, if you want to get a super cool overview of uh, physics read his books or, or listen to his lectures. He was amazing. He is really probably the best uh, physics communicator that uh, that I, I know of anyway. So please do. Um, anyway, back to your paper. I, 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 I'm sure that some of the people here are not, uh, you know, physicists necessarily. Uh, so, so yeah, just if anything is not clear, then just do send your questions in the chat, right? And uh, yeah, back to the paper, Alberto. If you, Alberto, maybe if you could now um, give us your your kind of view on what the paper is actually about and um, quantum machine learning a little bit more specifically. Yeah, I can I can try to 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 explain what the paper is uh, is about. I mean, Ivano is one of the main authors of the paper, so. It, I feel like going back to university in front of my professor and trying to <laughs> <laughs> to, to show I understood. Well, you've uh, got lots of people watching you, so come on, pressure is on. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, very, I mean, let me try to, to explain it very simply. So th this is a classification problem. So imagine you, you, you have your uh, your nice accelerator and, and detector and uh, you smash the, 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 the protons together and you produce uh, this uh, huge amount of, uh, of, uh, of data. Then you want to look for something very specific and maybe for something that doesn't happen so often, very rare. So you need to f really to to extract this uh, needle from from the from the haystack. Um, so one way of doing this, there are uh, quite uh, you know there are a number of techniques, but uh, you know a machine learning technique co called uh, support vector machine is one of the of the ways of, of doing it. Essentially, you know it's a way of finding uh, some way of separating. Uh, something from something else you know, a signal from the background the, uh, the the thing you want to find from uh, from everything else now for for uh, for simple problems in general it's not difficult to find a, a solution you have a, you know a line a plane of some type that splits 
your data into good guys and, and, and bad guys. Uh, now, assume your your data is not that simple. You have a, you know a, a lot of uh, features, a lot of properties, a lot of dimensions, and uh, uh, maybe the things you want to find are not so. Uh, you know, are, are very small. The number of, of, of things you want to find is very small compared to to everything else. So finding uh, how to to separate uh, the the signal from the background is not uh, so easy anymore. Finding this uh, plane is not so easy. Now, plane is uh, is uh, is, a, is a general word. It's not a, a flat plane. It's a plane that could be in a hyperspace a plane in in multiple uh, dimensions. So the support vector machine can still be used. But you need to find a way of uh, sort of transforming from the complexity uh, of, of this uh, hyperdimensional uh, space uh, into something linear that uh, you can uh, you can work on. So there are that, that there are ways of doing this. You know, normally with in support vector machines, you use uh, functions, mapping functions, the kernels, uh, and and the technique works. Now, uh, as the problem be becomes more complex and uh, the, the, the 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 number of, uh, of possibilities increases. Uh, uh, it is difficult to find the good functions to do this, able to represent correctly the, 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 the information hidden the, the, inside, uh, inside the space. Now, it has been demonstrated already by, by other people, in, actually, I think uh, IBM researchers, that it is theoretically uh, true that by using uh, quantum kernels, uh, it is possible to achieve uh, uh, what, what is called typically advantage, to do something that uh, computational from a computational efficiency point of view is not possible to do with the, with the, with classic uh, um, uh, machines so, so the paper takes that approach that uh, theoretical approach and actually demonstrates this with a, re with a realistic case so it, it's a case of the, the the event that we were uh, looking for it's a, a, this is a reproduction of something that has already been found with classic ways but we were trying to see whether it is possible to speed this up you know it's a it's a particular um higgs boson uh, production and and, and decay uh, channel mechanism um so the idea it, by, by using these quantum kernels it is possible to to show in in, in the paper that uh, not only on on simplified models uh, uh, the, the the quantum approach has uh, the uh, today the same level of, uh, of accuracy but uh, it, it, it in, in some cases converges uh, faster and uh, what is important uh, what is uh, you know potentially going to give the advantage is that by increasing the dimensionality increasing the complexity of the problem increasing the amount of data while the classic techniques will sooner or later fail this quantum approach will not because uh, the, because of the way quantum computers uh, work so Today, this has been demonstrated within uh, the, the, the limit of the current uh, technology. And, uh, you know, uh, by, you know, by using uh, computers that uh, will, uh, will certainly at this point come in the future, sooner or later, we will pass this, uh, this threshold and uh, do things that uh, today or even the future with classic machines, classic computers will not be possible to to do so it, it's it's incredible so if we can find this kind of advantage in this kind of a classification problems in anomaly detection in simulation then uh, it, it will uh, change a lot in in the way we work yeah for sure for sure um yeah and you mentioned uh, advantage quite a few times and uh, actually well let me ask Ivano, I, I'm sure you could answer that uh, uh, just as well Alberto but I just want to get Ivano's view on uh, on this this work you you guys are doing and uh ivano at the same time if you could also explain uh to our audience here what quantum advantage actually is in in simple terms well okay there are several definitions of quantum advantage i think it's very hard to give uh, an exhaustive answer to this question so let me say that in high energy physics, we know that uh, there are problems for which the classical solution requires uh, an exponentially large number of resources. So what are uh, these uh, resources? Uh, is they can be CPU hours or simply memory. So, so much memory that we cannot uh, afford on a classical uh, computer. With a quantum computer, instead, we aim at solving these problems more efficiently. So this means uh, with uh, a polynomial scaling uh, in the number of qubits instead of exponential. And this would give uh, definitely a great advantage. 
every time you add a single qubit to a quantum processor, you double the power of your processor. So this is uh, the, the great, uh, uh, say, improvement uh, in quantum technology compared to classical. Mm -hmm. Then, for instance, in the case of data classification, the use of uh, the exponentially larger qubit space uh, can enhance uh, the classification process that uh, Alberto just mentioned a second ago, but also in jet reconstruction and lattice gauge theory calculations we think that uh, one day the quantum uh, computer will enable the solution of problems that are impossible uh, nowadays. Even if you use uh, the largest uh, high performance computer, classical high performance computer on Earth. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that is incredible. That's true. Um, so uh, actually, a question for you, Ivana, here from the chat, uh, speaking of something a little bit different. Somebody is asking, uh, Ivano, you mentioned about uh, using quantum computing to process the data generated when two particles collide in collider. How long does this process actually take? Doesn't that, um, and what's the nature of data? Sorry, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Uh, yes, uh, basically the person is asking whether there is any data collapse or data alternation in this process. I hope you understand that. Uh, Better than I do, Ivano. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's a very complicated question. So l let me uh, interpret it. Uh, so the, the, the data produced uh, um, in this uh, experiment are produced really a very high pace. I think Alberto can answer better than me. And uh, obviously, these they need to be filtered in one way in order to be uh, possible to process them, analyze uh, them. Um, I think that the problem of the speed is not an issue here because, as I said, the, the data comes uh, so fast uh, that uh, the, the decoherence time of uh, the quantum computer uh, that is in the microsecond, uh, hopefully soon in the millisecond domain, will not uh, limit um, the analysis uh, uh, of these uh, processes with a quantum computer. But I'm not sure that I'm interpreting correctly the question. Maybe if I, if I can complement that. I, I think we need to clarify also the question because it looks to me that the, maybe this is related to what I said at the beginning. That is my dream, the possibility of getting quantum data out of a detector and feeding that data directly into a quantum computer, which today is not possible. So the two things today would not happen at all at the same time in the same place and at the same time. So we are not talking about taking the data generated uh, by the, the, the collision of the particle and taking this data directly uh, into a quantum computer. So this data is, uh, trans is classical data, is digital data that is uh, then stored in, in classic uh, digital storage. And then the processes, uh, the, the classification, uh, the, the tracking, whatever analysis you want to do is, uh, is done on this classic data uh, using uh, uh, a quantum computer or a combination between classic uh, and, uh, and and quantum. Um, so, for example, the, the the support vector machine problem of classification we were describing is actually a combination of the two. The, the quantum kernels are are the quantum part, uh, and uh, the actual classification optimization happens on uh, still on classic uh, computer. Is a is a good uh, is a way of using quantum computer to to accelerate some some uh, operations. So, in so the, the, the problem of uh, the, the data collapsing or the, the entanglement collapsing is not related to the, the, the quantum states of the, data, of the particles coming out of the, of the detector. So that has to be clear. Uh, so if that is, is clear, then uh, I think the, 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 the answer is, uh, is easy. So th there is no relation at the moment between the two things. Okay, okay, cool. Well, um, going back to what you guys were talking about earlier the, on uh, specifically on quantum machine learning, right? Uh, I, I suppose that 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 is very different from uh, collision analysis, uh, right? And uh, so quantum with quantum computers now at your kind of disposition, do you think you can make even more progress with specifically with that type of research? So, yeah, I mean, yes, for sure. So the, the, we have mentioned, the, Ivan and myself, uh, that I mean, classification is one of the, of the problems. Any, any 
process and in computation where there is uh, this uh, exponential uh, scaling effect uh, potentially is uh, a good uh, uh, match for uh, for quantum computers and this happens in many places Ivan uh, has talked about uh, reconstruction jet reconstruction that is an amazing problem you know, when when you have this data coming out of the detector these are you know essentially coordinates uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, energy measurements etc and this data is, uh, is is really digital data and then you have these dots you know imagine you know take a, a detector it's like uh, you know a, uh, a cylinder and you slice the cylinder and you have a, a circle in the center happen the collision and then you have these showers the jets of particles crossing everywhere but what you see is these digital dots and then you have to reconstruct the tracks so no, normally i mean scientifically it's not very accurate but i, I use the analogy of if you know these um, puzzles for kids when you have uh, dots uh, and the numbers and you follow the numbers and, and you build a, a picture, a track. So imagine doing that with billions of, of these dots and no numbers, okay? So <laughs> where do you go? So that, that's, it's, a, it's an extremely difficult problem. It's a combinatorial problem. Every step opens up more possibilities and more possibilities and new showers. So th this is a problem that uh, it's uh, really suitable for, uh, for quantum uh, computers. So if you know, we need to find the right algorithms, there are possibilities. Quant some application of quantum uh, neural network, quantum graphs, uh, quantum uh, uh, graph networks uh, are a possible approach. Tensor network is a, po are a possible approach, and there are other uh, other places in simulation. You know, using today simulation is done with Monte Carlo uh, models. Monte Carlo models are very efficient, very precise, but they don't scale well. Or better, the resources don't scale well with precision. If you want to increase the precision and the complexity of the models, you need more and more and more resources. At a certain point, uh, you reach a limit. So we are experimenting with uh, deep neural networks, with uh, generative adversarial models to reduce the time and, and the resources. And you know, the step beyond that is quantum generative adversarial networks. Can we reproduce uh, the same uh, probability distributions that, uh, that we, 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 we created with Monte Carlo much more efficiently than what we can do today, etc. So in theory problems, uh, you know, uh, Ivano mentioned the lattice gauge problems, uh, uh, you know, quark gluon plasma and quantum Boltzmann uh, uh, theories. So th this is really fascinating and it opens up uh, possibilities that we, we, we don't have today. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, I'm just a little bit mindful of the time here. Um, there's still a lot of questions, uh, but uh, I think we're only going to be able to answer one more now. And I'm going to kind of combine it with the question I had uh, for, for you, uh, Ivano. So somebody is asking here, how do we monitor, contribute, and learn from the CERN quantum initiatives and collaboration? So this is the question from the chat. And just to conclude, if you could kind of tell us uh, about the future of this collaboration that you guys are now, you know, entering, uh, and what what can we see in the future coming out of CERN and IBM working together? Uh, yeah, of course. So our goal is uh, is uh, to further explore uh, the potential of quantum uh, computing in high energy physics. This is uh, the goal uh, of our uh, collaboration uh, with CERN. Uh, this obviously requires a different type of uh, knowledge, and uh, and from, for instance, the expertise uh, on uh, particle physics will definitely come uh, from uh, CERN. But also we will need uh, the development uh, of uh, new resources uh, and new algorithms. So we have to improve our uh, software, offering uh, more uh, modules for uh, high energy physics so that we can leverage uh, in the best way possible uh, the computational advantage uh, offered by quantum computers. Mm -hmm. And this, when I say quantum computers, uh, I mean near term and also long-term quantum computers and long-term quantum computers means uh, full tolerant quantum computer that uh, will come uh, one day uh, all this uh, will hopefully allow for uh, um, the exploration of uh, new frontiers in high energy physics uh, we were discussing dark matter dark energy all these fascinating uh, uh, fields that uh, um, uh, are still without uh, an answer 
and uh, therefore contributing to a better understanding uh, of the universe at all scales. And if uh, in this journey we can also uh, have uh, some uh, interesting demonstration of quantum advantage for uh, real applications, uh, that is uh, clearly welcome. So this is also our main goal and idea. Yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, on, on my side, uh, I mean, of course, uh, I agree with, uh, with what Ivan is saying, but specifically for CERN, so again, I, I, I insist a lot on collaboration, and th th this is the real, the real goal. And the, the, you mentioned there was a question on how do we monitor, so it depends what you mean. So for people to look at, again, I mentioned the website, but we are going to have events uh, and workshops, and, and uh, we are going to make, to make all publications available, so it is possible to monitor the research. Then there is another aspect of monitoring. The other way is uh, how do we monitor the impact? How do we monitor that uh, in, indeed, uh, uh, you know, actually what we do is, uh, is, is, is making an impact uh, even potentially. So there are various ways. One, one thing that we are, we are planning of building, for example, apart from specific projects, is a, a, a sort of community-oriented uh, platform where actually we can uh, really monitor the progression and of development of algorithms for, for uh, high energy physics uh, and uh, their uh, implementation on uh, on, uh, on the newer generations of uh, of platforms, so we can really understand uh, where we are going and what we can do. So, assume we start today with uh, NISC uh, computers, we understand how the algorithms behave with uh, with the today error mitigation uh, techniques. But then, when full tolerant machines come and we, we have uh, you know full error. Uh, corrections and we have millions of cubes then of, of qubits then we can we will be able to expand uh, the, the dimensions of the problems uh, we, we have and by by working by creating this uh, you know this pool of knowledge database of knowledge with the community for the community i mean we will be able to understand whether we are going in the right direction and what are the areas where it it makes sense to invest intellectually and also financially yeah absolutely well Great, you know, thank you so much to both of you. It's uh, been amazing. Uh, and uh, also thank you for everybody who joined us today. Uh, we've introduced quite a lot of technical concepts. If you guys want to know more, first of all, you have to subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss any future shows. But you can also go back because in the past we did talk about quantum computing a little bit more kind of on the basic level. Uh, if you want to look, for example, in our February YouTube webinar with Heike Ryle, you will see um, we talk, we explain all these terms a little bit more in detail. And then you can go back to this one and uh, listen to Alberto and Ivana all over again because it's going to stay online, of <laughs> course. <laughs> so, and if you have any comments, any questions, um, any ideas, do reach out uh, to me and to our experts. Uh, I am on Twitter as uh, SciTechCat please do message me whenever you want. Thank you again and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.